Could the Freedom Party about to have a big impact in the Victorian election? We speak to their deputy leader in an exclusive interview. I'm Roman McKinnon. This is Spin Check. Good evening and welcome. Well, with a new month beginning, the Victorian election still feels a long way away. But with 149 days to go, new parties are beginning to pop up ahead of the deadline later this month. One of those parties is the Freedom Party of Victoria, set up by Morgan C. Jonas, who resigned as a UAP candidate during the federal election campaign and, and, and ended up running as an independent Senate candidate. The party's deputy is Aidan McLinden, a former LNP member who created the Queensland Party, which later formed with the Catters Australia Party. He then went on to run for Family First in the Senate. Earlier, our chief anchor Leo Puglisi caught up with McLinden in an exclusive interview. Take a look. Our objective is not so much, you know, I mean, every party forms to get people elected, absolutely, but I think... It's our focus is more of having an influence in the outcome. And um, whilst you have these minor parties have a lot of similarities as well, but you know, you would see that the major parties have a lot of similarities as well. Uh, Kevin Rudd could have easily been a Liberal um, Party Prime Minister and Malcolm Turnbull equally could have been a Labor Party Prime Minister. So I think the difference between the Liberal Labor um, is becoming thinner and thinner. So I think, uh, I think all political parties to some degree um, have that relevance or that point of different struggle. And I would say that in Australia, it's personal, personality politics um, has probably played a much greater role than policy-based politics is probably where it should be the battle of ideas and good policy. Um, but I think what we saw, especially in the federal election, was probably an anti-Scott Morrison vote rather than a pro-Anthony Albanese vote. Um, you know, often governments uh, lose elections and oppositions win by default. And I think we've seen that when they've only got one third of Australian support to govern, uh, which is hardly a mandate. Um, but I think, yeah, I think there's enough options there that will precipitate. And I do think Australia is currently going through a very different paradigm. Well, we sort of need a Mendes 2.0 or, you know, something to happen. And I think that that will happen in, the, in probably the shortest three to five years. Well, well, you said there um, that I guess you're running a bit more so to try to influence those results. Um I, I, can, I can imagine as, as soon as someone sees those comments, they're going to say, okay, you're just trying to, you know, funnel preferences, um, which might I add, um, can, you know, there are preference deals made uh, for uh, voting in the Victorian upper house. It's a unique situation there. Um, people might just, okay, you're just trying to funnel preferences towards uh, UAP where Morgan C. Jonas was uh, running for um, or, or, an, or another party. Um, uh, then... You know, how how can you explain to potential voters um, why they should vote you if if your votes might just be trying to influence something you're not actually going to get a seat as by your own admission? Well, I think the the outcome, as I said, it, it, having our objective is to have influence in the process. Um, if you win seats as an added bonus, that's fantastic, and ultimately that's every party's goal. Um, but also, equally, every party has to channel their preferences somewhere. I mean, the Greens will, you know, always, uh, more often than not, if not always, preference them to Labor. So, you know, equally, the Greens might, you could suggest that, oh, they only exist to, to channel to Labor, but they actually influence Labor's agenda. And as you see Labor have more and more influence from the Greens, equally, there are other minor parties um, that would have influence uh, on the Conservative side of politics or the Liberal side of politics. So... Never underestimate, particularly in the upper house, because we have the bicameral system in, in Victoria, uh, you can have huge influence in outcomes. I mean, there's some seats like the seat of Nepean, for example, with eight, 900 votes difference between the two parties. So minor parties can um, play a huge role in determining the outcome of, uh, of, of which candidate they think would best represent that area in the, in the state parliament. So it's like, um, you know, I mean, to get... In, in, even in races, like you know, you, you want to get to the Olympics doesn't mean you'll get a gold, but you're still going to be in one of those lanes, and you've probably 
tried hugely throughout that time and you could still end up being a great coach or there's always something in the sporting world. And I like to use that analogy because equally with politics, uh, the outcome may not, you know, have somebody elected to the parliament, but going through that process and influencing different parties on the way can have a, a long-term impact. And and just quickly before we move on, um, and we do point out, you know, on, only voters choose preferences, except there's that upper, up, you know, if you vote above the line in the Victorian upper house, then, um, you know, minor parties, there there can be a bit of a, you know, essentially a backroom deal um, in terms of where their preferences go. And again, it is unique to Victoria right now. WA dumped it last election. Um, do, do you think that's fair that uh, voters can vote above the line for a party, say the Freedom Party, and then, you know, probably wouldn't be aware where their preferences are going if because of these, you know, backroom preference-flowing deals? I think you're absolutely correct. I think the back uh, the backroom deals that have been happening historically uh, are at best unethical. Uh, I think we need to enter a new paradigm uh, where we have ethical parties operating in a block where they're transparent, where they can tell the public exactly where their preferences are going to go. And um, and the Freedom Party will absolutely do that. We need to, if we want to change the way governance is done, we need to look at our own backyards in terms of how political organisations work. If they can't be transparent publicly, um, then who knows what they're going to do when they get in. And I believe we need to begin that circuit breaker now, exposing backroom deals that have been done, especially if there's been any financial transactions, and I'm aware that ha- has happened uh, over the last 20, 25 years, that game's over because people who have traded democracy for money, uh, not only would that constitute potentially uh, bribery, uh, but what it does, it actually says democracy is up for sale and you could get parties on 0.2 or 0.3% of a vote catapulted to the upper house where no one has a clue who they are or what they stand for. And we've seen this in the pandemic bill that was extended in Victoria where we had these three minor parties uh, in the crossbenches, across the floor to extend the powers. And you look at some of these votes, some of them got three or 4,000 votes. That influences 6.8 million people. That game has to stop. Yes, there are limitations in terms of the primitive system that we have, and that may well change going forward. We have to do, have to obviously operate within the legislation of what we've been given currently. But I think it's time to blow the lid on that, be transparent, and the public should know at least four weeks out from the election or even two, three months would be ideal of exactly where parties stand and where their preferences are flowing. If you believe it's if it's uneth do you be- if you believe it's unethical, as you said there, do you support dumping it like every single other house in the entire country, state, territory, federal, uh, does not have any way for parties to control preferences except for the Victorian upper house. Would, would, would do you do you support D- dumping group voting? Look, I, I think that's the problem is what are you going to replace it with? Um, as I said, the unethical side of it that I was talking about was specifically, I guess, in, in preferences not being transparent or the exchange of goods or financial services um, in exchange for preferences, which, which is me. You shouldn't be horse trading, full stop. Um, in terms of replacing with a better system, is there scope for it? Absolutely. I'm not sure what that system is. Uh, it, it can be when you've got a system that can catapult somebody into the parliament on 0.2% of the vote, then clearly it would need reviewing. Um, Yeah. And sometimes first party posts can also come with limitations because you might have, you know, 15 parties and someone gets 6% of the vote, but that could be the highest um, first past the post. So that in itself has weaknesses as well. But I do think uh, we, we are heavily over governed as a very small country and, um, yeah, and largely, I think state governments have, have spent an exorbitant amount of money and they're largely, they should be largely relevant. We should have strong local governments and, and a federal, a strong federal government. We've got these billions and billions of dollars of um, bureaucracy that is largely unnecessary. And I think the whole system needs to be removed. And the party is looking for candidates. We've got a full list of every single party in Australia's history on our website, sixnewsau.com. And that is Spin Check for this evening. Thanks so much for tuning in. A reminder, we have 24-7 headlines and breaking news on our website, 6newsau.com. Leo will be back on Sunday night to present the latest headlines and, of course, at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. But for now, I'm political reporter Roman McKinnon. Have a great night.